Yo, yo, yiggity, yo. What's good? And welcome back to Philosophy Digestion. And today we are talking about part two of Game of Thrones history and philosophy. Don't have much business to take care of, so I'm excited to jump back in with a rhetorical question. Do you remember when Marjorie figured out that Cersei had planted a giant green firebomb underneath of the Westeros megachurch? But there was that balding priest guy with the eyes who wouldn't let anyone in the church leave because it was God's house and God commanded that they stay. So, second in status for the whole Kingdom of England in the last millennium were those genius clergymen and all of their faithful followers. So if the king was chosen by God to rule the land that we all live on, then the clergymen were chosen by God to be God's, aka the king's, media outlets and personal PR representatives, totally in control of the spin that the people are given on current events, religious texts, and how to live their day-to-day -day lives. The media is the other half of the government's control, and it did not work out very well. The clergy in 17th century Britain held weekly ceremonies called Mass. And Mass is where they told stories of God's wonder exactly how to earn that favor. That's also where, the, during the homily, the priest would give the king's hot takes as though they were the interpretation of the Bible. In literature, people seemed aware religious and political figures were corrupt and didn't interpret the Bible accurately. Like Shakespeare and Chaucer, they wrote about priests taking bribes and being shitty people, but it wasn't necessarily allowed or believed if a peasant were to accuse a priest or the king of some kind of abuse. So we already see contradictions in how society's telling stories versus how they act in the face of authority. Clergymen in the 1000s through the 1900s were really tight with the lords and ladies of the land. Their systematic rape and abuse of children would not be exposed for about another 500 years after the events of the War of the Roses in the 2015 Oscar-winning movie, Spotlight. So under the priests in the hierarchy, you know, the ones who provide immediate services to the lords and ladies, uh, property managers, teenage baristas, welders, arms dealers, actors, scholars, lawyers, you know, people who have talent, but were also crafty and came from good Christian homes and had the approval of the lords and ladies who had control of the resources. Those lords and ladies were the people who made decisions for the commoners and who represented the sheep peasants who can't read in the face of the king. The business owners in the communities, so keep in mind that business owners and lords and ladies' children tend to intermingle, you know, they're not completely separated. If they decide they don't support the king, they can start to spread word that perhaps the king is unjust, and God would not put an unjust king on the throne. So working class characters can be extremely influential because lords and ladies and the upper class tend to listen to their perspectives at least a lot more than the you know common folk the laborers so people in westeros who are you know pivotal to the plot but perhaps more of a working lower class are like hodor micah miranda and masande they're pivotal to the plot but you also might notice I'm kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel looking for super influential peasants. And it's the same with history. And so in the 15th century, they believed that society had kings and stuff because that's God's plan. And God put the king on the throne and made you and me a peasant because that's how God and the king said it was supposed to be. It's just to go about it this way, and we can't change it. 
As you're born into this land, it nourishes you, and you work its crops, you are tied to the land you're born on, and so the ruler of that land. These were the things that gave people comfort and made most people feel safe, you know, believing that their lives are as God intends. That makes their service servant status meaningful. And their king, living in luxury, that's fair because it's incentive for him to that every peasant must do their part to contribute to that society. Or else they're going against what's right. They're going against God. So though it was a religious belief in a faith-based time for the people, if we look at it, at it from today's point of view, we also do see that the people working the fields wasn't just because God told them to. They were paid in military and political and legal and home economic and financial services from the kingdom. They were completely dependent on the king and the king's infrastructure for everything that they had. It was their government. Money, food, protection, opportunity, land, clout from the king. People were jazzed if the prince that they supported who lived closest to them, whose kids intermingled with my community, I would be stoked to see that prince sit on the throne because I knew that those resources are gonna come back to me just by proximity. You're closest to the center, baby. And that means that we'll probably enjoy, you know, the spoils of war. We can even tell ourselves that it's God's reward for being good and stopping injustice. While the church's ultimate authority directs the people's spiritual morals, it was the king's justice and wealth that won loyalty and faith. So, like, Masande obviously had a personal investment in Daenerys's win. It's not just that she happened to choose the ruler that was truly destined by God or the Seven or whatever to sit on the throne. God's spokesperson, Father Simon or whoever, like, she's I. But it's Daenerys who's, who's bringing in the bread for the Dothraki. You know what I'm saying? And it is those closest to the ones doing the taking that get rich the quickest and the easiest. And then all of a sudden, their stocks and their investments are also backed by real world resources the homies have taken. Though they sit on the throne and decide where it all goes. So if you'll remember, Richard Joffrey II is on the throne, the Child King. He's got emotional issues because of likely childhood trauma. He may have been put on the throne unjustly in front of his uncles when his dad and his grandpa died very closely together. The clergy probably thought that this Child King would be easy to control, and so did the other lords and ladies who were sitting around the King's Council. But as this Richard Joffrey II grew up, his temper tantrums, his meltdowns, his bad behavior, and the fact that people didn't really like him anyway, started to eat away at the faith that people had in him to be God's just king. And so in 1388, the king's uncles, like Stannis and Renly Baratheon, so the Duke of Lancaster and the Duke of York, along with Lancaster's son, Henry IV, used the voices of the church and of their friends in the working class world to spread promises of a just king and richer bread for their people. And this convinces their people to march. And so Richard II, the king, is like really pissed about these rebellions. People have just been telling him he's king his whole life, so I don't imagine he took this well. Hearing that they don't want him on the throne probably makes him scared for his life. He has some of his uncles, like Thomas Gloucaster, murdered, and he takes all of the political representation from people like his uncle Thomas Gloucaster away. And that means that the people that he lived by and represented to the king didn't have any more representation, <laughs> didn't have any say in the quality of bread they got. So this King Richard II, he's so mad about these protests that he banishes John Lancaster and his son, Henry IV, to somewhere far away, I think it was like Norway. And it makes no sense that Henry's name is Henry IV to me, but that's what they call him. 
So Henry the Fourth is banished, and he's his cousin is on the throne and is being crazy and is totally like the unjust king Joffrey. So he's in Norway and he's writing letters to all of his noblemen, making sure that everyone is lined up for his return, and he's planning his return for while the king is in Ireland abusing those people and stealing all of the potatoes. So. Henry IV and a bunch of other highborn folks put in some legwork to raise a rebellion among the English people who aren't favored anymore by Richard II. And they all convince the people that actually, yeah, that actually Henry IV should have become king, not Richard. While Richard's in Ireland stealing their potatoes, God bless the Irish, Henry IV invades England with his army and takes the throne fairly easily, only sacrificing the lives of meaningless peasants. The Red Keep was actually just open for them to march in, so no burning like Daenerys. And upon Richard's return, he was captured and thrown in prison where he starved to death. That poor little abused king boy, who was probably a bad person, but who I do feel sorry for. So, Henry the Fourth Lancaster now represents the Lancaster's Red Rose on the Iron Throne. They had the lords and ladies of England met and decided how to redistribute the bread and the oil and the spices and the sugar and the gold that they had and that they had claimed from the places that they invaded and imperialized, like France. The British people have become pretty dependent on importing really cheap bread from France, but the French people have had most of their good bread taken from them or quote-unquote purchased or taxed by the English invaders, just like they did to the Irish potatoes. And so the French commit a foreign attack on the World Bread Center in Winchester, disrupting the redistribution of French resources and killing a lot of average Joe Englishmen in the process, as well as some high-ranking lords and ladies who have control over a lot. And most of these people were just trying to get some bread and oil to bring home to the family. The British people rely on the redistribution of French bread to feed their people because, honestly, they're too lazy and stupid to make bread of their own and share it too. They'd rather invest in other things and have the worthless French people send them oil and bread. And the French are sick of the British pound being worth so much more than their francs, I think. And that being used as a system of abuse. They're sick of prejudice against their people. And so the French commit disrupting the economic flow of French resources to kin breadwinners. So Henry IV dies in 1413. And Henry V, his son, comes up. And people like him because he starts a war on terror with France. He invades their land and forces them to sign a treaty that says, we get all your bread and oil. I mean, yeah, we get all your bread and oil. And I'm going to marry this French princess, Catherine, to assert my dominance on your royal bloodline. And we win, you lose. We're taking your resources and your people are going to work for us now. By the way, here are your new values. There were constant invasions from the holy people, the Welsh, the strong, the Scottish men of the north, and the French just across the narrow sea. And so now it's English King Henry VI. And English King Henry VI banks on this conflict because it's easy for him to use it to convince his English people that everyone else is actually a violent terrorist and we have the right to reign as ruling kings deciding where all the bread and the oil go. Okay, so Henry V and Catherine, his French princess, uh, I don't know, prisoner wife, they're both dead by 1422 and their one-year-old, this Henry VI, was chosen by God to be king as it goes. So there is a one-year-old king on the throne. And once again, who's in charge of the infant but the clergyman? Gods, marketing consultants, and personal PR representatives. But also partly in the care of his dad's third cousin, 
whose name is Richard III, Duke of York. If you'll remember, it was someone from York who had a very good claim to the throne back when the Child King was first set on it. So Henry VI Lancaster is the second Child King of the story, and in Game of Thrones, that was Tommen. And he's just like Tommen, because he married Marjorie, I mean Margaret, who was a French princess, just like his mom, Catherine, so incest. So some in history remember Richard III, the king's guardian, like Littlefinger, a manipulator, and someone who had their claw on members of the royal family. But some people in history see him more like a Tyrion, kind of a sensitive, frail guy who's extremely intelligent, well-traveled, and well-spoken, and very good at organizing with different groups of people to find peace. Either way, there was a war, and neither Tyrion nor Littlefinger were real in history. Eventually, this Tommen, King Henry VI, grows and marries that French princess, Margaret. And she thinks that Richard III, the uncle, and his white roses from House York are super lame compared to the Lancaster red roses. So they're all eating dinner one night in the throne room. Uh, there's Richard III, the king, Marjorie, the queen, uh, sorry, Margaret, the queen, their two sons, and Margaret's friend, the Duke of Somerset. So Somerset and Marjorie are like pretty liberal for the time. They don't think the war in France is actually about and it's about taking French people's oil and bread. And Margaret thinks that this guy, Duke of Somerset, would be a better hand to the king than Richard III. So Richard, who's more like a traditional Englishman and wants to see France and England separate, and Margaret, the ex-French princess and new English queen, kinda out of the room. He'd rather see one English king uniting all as God intended. So they're all eating dinner together and Margaret is pretty passive aggressive towards Richard. She's always asking him to do stuff away from the king and shutting him out of his adopted son's life. And eventually their fighting gets so bad and the king's, I think, I bet you he's pretty pussy whips, like Tom and like George R. R. Martin probably got that right. So they have Richard III exiled, just like Tyrion. And then Somerset is placed in power, but that French influence and agenda makes the conservative English folk feel like the oil and bread that they're dependent on and feel like they should be free to just take. They get scared that they're going to lose it all and they feel desperate and they perceive pain. And so the Bible thumping south of the UK, England, gets super pissed and they suddenly start treating the French like they're complete terrorists and like Marjorie or Margaret needs to be removed from the throne room. They do not wanna to have to treat French people with respect. And like half the country who remains with no food or PPE during the bubonic pandemic, were like so desperate to get bread handed to them because every time they get a new great way to make bread, the king or the lords and ladies, they don't even have to purchase the startup because they already own it. They control even the smallest means of production and will take a tax of their choosing from that production and then call it fair trade. So the people are scared about losing their cheap oil and they're willing to fight to the death so that a new non-French king can sit on the throne and continue the war on terror. And Marjorie's like, um, the French are not as weak as you're telling the English people they are. They're actually like just like you guys, they just speak French. And I have no idea where this narrative came up about bread and stuff, but y'all need to cool it. We can build economic ties and start treating each other as equals and benefit from, you know, I feel like she may have been a pretty progressive woman for the time. But if you're an English person, your brother was killed 
in a French tour attack and your friends are dead, it sounds like you're not going to have cheap oil anymore. People from the South, Bible thumping of the UK, their, extri- their whole identity is based in nationalism. The land they were born on makes them unique and ties them to their king. They, with all their hearts, believe that they're fighting for justice and prosperity and freedom for their people because their king will bring goodness to these other countries' leaders, just like the clergymen say. You know, the media outlets. So the business owners and the people who need to eat start having it rougher in England as France starts winning the Hundred Year War. 1400s business owners and clergy start spinning a narrative of corruption. And the people start to lose support for Tommen and Marjorie. Just like the Tyrells were condemned in Game of Thrones for not being faithful to the Seven, the French were painted as bad Christians with bad leadership and a barbaric culture. Uh, The liberals supporting the French were certainly embezzling money. The French weren't necessarily good guys either. The French had the same corrupt goals of imperialism that the English had, and we can see that in things like the Louisiana Purchase. French leadership was European and violent and corrupt, just like the English is, and their peasants just happened to suffer more because the English were the ones who won. So Richard III, Duke of York, sees all of this conflict happening, He's been exiled by Marjorie to Norway or somewhere. And he seizes the opportunity, just like the king's grandfather did. He wrote letters. He met with other business people, landlords, kings, ladies, and he colluded with anti-French English nobles. And between battles and pulling strings, he convinced the people of House York and their peasants to get the French out of the English throne room. That inner conflict and war actually causes the English to pull most of their troops out of the Middle Eastern parts of France and the whole country. And this causes Henry VI, who was also an orphan in the care of priests, mind you, to have a complete mental breakdown. So they've lost the 100 year war with France. Not only, not, not did they reach an agreement, they lost and the English people have turned against him and his French wife. So this guy, Henry VI, is not having a good time, completely losing it, and no one wants French Margaret or her kids in charge, so she's killed, and her two kids like run away or something. And when the king is killed and Marjorie's dead or gone, who should take the throne but another descendant of the first King Ed. Richard III, Duke of York himself. And his white rose are placed on the throne as the red falls to the ground. So Richard III is the king, and plot twist, he's not Tyrion or Littlefinger. He actually represents a merge of those two characters in Cersei Lannister who killed or exiled Marjorie, caused Tommen to have a mental breakdown and die, who uses both religion and her place as queen regent to manipulate other people and put herself onto the throne. But the war's not over. The boys that ran away, one of them, Henry VII Lancaster, is still out there. And the arguing and the violence over foreign oil, everyone realizes, was a huge mistake. Because a few decades have passed. The narrow sea is not that big. And the people of France and the people of Britain began to, just like Marjorie and the king, intermarry. And start to see each other as more of a common people. And, you know, they just had two French queens in a row. Englishmen started to see the French as less threatening. And the liberal youth didn't want as much war and terror in France. So Henry VII Lancaster, after all his plotting, marches his armies in this section of the war and sits on the fucking Iron Throne
So there's House York on the throne and Henry Seven Lancaster's house plotting off the throne. There's rebellions and fights and protests and conflict. And amidst it all, as England is falling apart, the wealth of the Scottish and the Irish bide their time. As England falls apart slowly from the inside, there's war, brothers killing brothers, houses killing friends killing friends, I guess houses not killing houses, but all the conflict makes it real easy for Henry the Seventh Lancaster to march his armies right into the throne room, kill King Richard the Third, and seat himself on the Iron Throne, where he forcibly marries himself to Richard the Third's niece, Elizabeth of York, uniting their bloodline, uniting their houses, and uniting the people who feel like they want to get a bigger piece of that king's redistributed resources. So all of the lords and ladies who were already fed and had health care felt like they were finally going to be getting a fair share of the English cut. And keep in mind they're still scared because they're, they've been dependent on cheap foreign bread for so long. But since their leaders found compromise in marriage and unity, the French and the English and the houses in England look at each other and they decide that maybe if they work together, they can just imperialize the rest of the world one piece at a time. The first king that we started with, Ed slash Robert Baratheon, convinced his homies and the peasants that God wanted his blood on the throne. And for reasons of religion or racism or control over foreign resources, the peasants and the people fought to the death and accepted the conditions of war to make that happen. They were mostly concerned with their, their access to resources, but weren't paying attention to who was limiting their means of producing resources themselves. In a documentary about Anglo-Saxons, some British dude said, as an island of people, the British are traditionally obsessed with the idea of foreign invasion. Both invading their land and the British invading the lands of others. British leaders were all about that. It's probably because they had so little land to begin with. And assuming that it's human nature to want more than one has, I think that that British man is referring to a tradition started by greedy inheritees who were mostly interested in gaining more land and resources for themselves and convincing other people that it's in their best interest to contribute to that society. Some of the people had talents and skills and could earn the favor of those with the gajillions, 1000s through the year 2000, when a powerful state's government takes over people, you know, in another land for moral reasons, the people who are on that land have suffered. That the local poor starving people just submit and I'll get jobs working at hotels and factories. No matter how shitty the people of the invaded land are treated, the alternative is no food and no community, and the lack of avail availability of natural resources, because they've all been taken and shipped to where the English-speaking people live. This podcast is about a long time ago, the year 1000 through the 1900s. Maybe we've come a long far since a far long way day since the days of the kings and queens, but, but this podcast does not and cannot ever truly apply to the conditions of the world today because money lets us abstract ourselves from it. American democracy is perfect, and I love the free media where we get our unbiased and perfectly balanced information about justice and territory from if you know what I really mean. 
Though the War of the Roses may have ended, peace did not come for England, and peace has not truly come for anyone. Next episode, the complicated propaganda battle for the North, the tragedy of the last true King of the North, hashtag say his name, Macbeth, the King James Bible, and the beginning of the Irish Troubles that literally did not end until the 1900s. Thank you for listening. If you want to put a bare minimum effort into something that would make a huge difference for our small team, you can rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast, share us on social media, or do anything you can to I am your host, John Gavin. Today's sources include Captive Histories, Anglo-Saxons Explained, Timeline World Histories Documentaries, Feature History, The World Wide Web's Military Wiki, BBC Radio 4, CNN Fox News, Wikipedia, and of course, the Catholic Church. Thank you to our music provider, Adobe. Check them out for licensed music. This podcast is produced on Acast Independent Podcast Network. If you want to advertise on this podcast, you can hit us up at management at humorus.net. M-A-N-A-G-M-E-N-T at H-U-M-O-R-U-S dot net. Until next time, take it easy.